Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Good morning, everyone. I am going to share my screen so that we can get started with our conversation today. And um, it is really interesting that that introduction, the way that I've sort of structured our time together um, is around this idea of paths. So I'm going to be transparent about some of the paths that I am taking and embarking on. And um, I'm just, again, just super excited to, to, to be here and talk to you about this idea of strategic synergy, um, a topic that has taken up a significant portion of my brain recently um, and over, not just recently, over the past two years, really. And so I'm just very excited to share um, space and place with everyone and especially folks who are passionate about um, open education. And I also want to say thank you to the conference organizers um, for the invitation to share space and place with other people who are passionate about open education. It is truly an honor to be here. And I, I do want to take a minute. I, I am located in Southeast Louisiana, and I just want to take it a, mi a minute to acknowledge anyone um, who was affected by the weather event that happened last night. Um, it, it was rather significant. Um, I was telling the organizers, I was concerned that I was going to have power because all around me, there are folks waking up to no power. And if you know anything about the South, it is extremely warm here and to not have power can turn dangerous very quickly. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the folks who were affected by that weather event um, from Texas all the way um, further east and uh, say thank you to the first responders and all the folks who are working today to make sure that that folks are safe. Um, as we begin our time together, I would like to share a quote um, that deals with my eight-year-old son, Finn, who is on the screen, his favorite thing right now, which is a video game. So uh, he was in the kitchen watching a video um, of, a, of a gamer playing the game. And he was uh, muttering this phrase rather repeatedly. Um, and I said, Finn, what are you saying? And he said, Minecraft, a game where the only limit is your imagination. And that really kind of stuck with me. Um, and so I want to also dedicate this talk to Finn, whose love for Minecraft reminds me of the limitless power of imagination in creating the world that I want to live in. So, um, it is a very pivotal moment in my life. Um, while all of the things in the introduction were true, yesterday was my last day at Southeastern Louisiana University. After 18 years of teaching, um, I decided that it was time to perhaps forge a new path in, in my career. And the underlying ethos of this presentation really is um, a lived experience and thinking about the strategic synergy of my knowledge and skills to innovate opportunity. And, and one of the reasons for the change um, was I really, really have become extremely passionate about opening up space to fully engage on the projects um, that I will be discussing um, in our time together. And I just felt that the 18 years of foundation as a full-time faculty member um, was enough to sort of step off of that path and try another one um, and, and really leverage all that I know to advocate for the things that I, I am passionate about. I'm still staying in the classroom, albeit in a different um, in a different capacity, not at full time, um, but as adjunct. But um, yeah, so I am going to be de debuting some new things um, as I start this new journey and our time today. So I was just really excited about um, the timing of everything um, because I just think where I am in my life and where I want to, and the things that I want to talk about today do form a really interesting synergy. So this morning, I invite you to join me on what I'm calling an innovative path. Uh, this path is not just a route from one point to another. It really is a look into my journey um, and all of the opportunities, breakthroughs, challenges, ideas, inspirations um, that are um, really laying the groundwork um, for where I think that the future of not only learning is headed, but also the future of work. 
Um, I'll begin by laying the groundwork and examining foundational concepts that will pave our path forward. And then I'm going to use a how might we framework, which I borrow from design thinking and discuss opportunities and challenges. And that includes projects that inspired me and the projects that I'm working on. And then at the end, um, I want to pause to reflect on some of the things that we talked about and um, hopefully provide you with some um key points to think about as you move forward, but more specifically, as you engage with the rest of the content in, in this, this conference. I, I want to leave you with um, some ideas that as you are listening to the excellent lineup of presentations uh, in the remainder of the synchronous portion, um, but also the asynchronous concepts, you can kind of think of some things that I've talked about and maybe find your own strategic uh, synergy. And then finally, I'll open the floor up for discussion and questions and we'll end our time that way. So a foundational concept for this talk is openness, right? So openness, as you see, I am using openness in the broadness, in the broadest terms, um, in terms of uh, operational definition. So it's the guiding principle and practice that purposefully makes access, participation, accountability, and transparency the primary areas of concern. And if you think about sort of the lexicon today in an openness ecosystem, we have a lot of facets of openness. We have open access, right? In terms of scholarly research, we have open data. Um, in terms of freely available data, we have ideas around open government, um, which is the idea of promoting transparency and accountability in, in governmental operations. We have open source, both in hardware and software, right? Uh, these tools that are designed to be publicly accessible. We have open standards, right? So technical standards that are publicly available and collaboratively developed. There's a lot of um, work in AI are right now around developing these sort of open standards so that one group kind of doesn't control the regulatory or the policy process, but that everybody is, you know, invited to participate in, in some way, shape, or form. We have open content, which you all are very familiar with in terms of freely available creative works and educational resources. There's open science, which advocates for making all aspects of scientific research accessible to all. And then there's even open AI, right? That, that little thing that we all, that like hit like, um, like uh, an asteroid um, in November of 2022 and sort of just disrupted everything. Um, but if you go to OpenAI's website to their about, they have a statement at the top that says, AI, we, are, we are an AI research and development company with the mission to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. So openness, it, it is out there. It is a concept that is not just specific to education, but it very much involves education, right? So then there's um, this concept of the innovation imperative. Um, and the innovation imperative is, again, not a concept that is completely relegated to education or even in open education, how I'm using it. The first time I heard this concept, it was in the technology space and in the business sector and sort of these ideas around being disruptive, break things to build things. And this idea that in order to sort of move society forward, most times for economical purposes, there has to be this innovation imperative because the world is constantly changing and business and technology have to change in order to keep up with this change. And so um, I sort of took that again under this idea of synergy and, and really wanted to think about the innovation imperative in terms of open education. And for me, that is an emphasis on continuous exploration and implementation of new approaches and new technologies and practices efforts to democratize access to high quality learning resources, enhance teaching effectiveness, foster global collaboration, promote um, lifelong learning opportunities for all learners, irrespective of their geographical, socioeconomical, or institutional constraints, and really embracing those facets that I discussed earlier, right, of open access and open data, and open educational practices, and other open initiatives, um, as an opportunity to drive innovation, but in a way that promotes and creates opportunity for engagement within educational context. And so, all right, so I'm like, okay, there's openness, there's innovation. Um, I'm seeing a lot of overlap in the language. Where do we go from here? 
And so I really wanted to start to, to, um, to conceptualize specific key ways that this could operate because in thinking of my own AI OER journey, this was really important because I need guard, I need guard well, guardrails and I need frameworks, especially when you're dealing with spaces that are volatile in terms of they're constantly changing. The, the platforms in the systems look one way today, um, but the next day they look completely different. And, you know, in my field of communication and more specifically to digital communication and media studies, we saw a lot of that this in the early internet studies, what the internet was imagined to be, you know, a couple decades ago into, and then thinking about what it has become, it's very different. We were talking about the internet at large and education very differently than the way that we talk about the internet and education now. Um, same with sort of social media. Um, in the early days, even though a lot of the social media tools were being used by you know, students, so it was in an educational space. We weren't thinking about social media as education. Fast forward to now and think about where a lot of the learning has happened, for good or for bad, it is happening in these sites and it has changed even the way that we deploy our educational content. And you're seeing a lot of mirroring of, we have shorter videos. Um, they don't always have to be, um, they don't always have to be polished. You see a lot of user generated content this idea of co-creating with students. So the students are in the educational materials that they're consuming. It's not just the professor or an expert. So again, it's just sort of thinking about the innovation imperative and in the ways that it operates, there were some, some guardrails that I put in place for myself. So I always wanted to think about the adaptation to technological advancements, right? So in an AI-driven landscape, technology evolves really rapidly. So what does that mean in the context of open education, right? What does that mean as we are creating these resources to be used by a multitude of folks? How are we thinking about um, ensuring that the content that we are producing or generating um, or even, even consuming is, is relevant in the midst of constant change? Another thing that's top of mind always is enhanced accessibility, right? So you hear a lot in these conversations around AI about the potential to enhance accessibility in education. Oftentimes I'm like, okay, give me the one, two, three, and the how, but it is true. And, and, and that ties very closely to open educational practices, um, universal design, and sort of the development of accessible learning resources and tools and, and ensuring that everybody is able to, to engage with the material in a meaningful way. That overlap was really important to keep top of mind. Another thing was the facilitation of lifelong learning opportunities. And that is sort of driven by my own personal experience uh, in higher education as a faculty member. I started um, in 2006 when I, I started teaching. I taught five sections of public speaking, which at our institution is a general education course. So just about everybody has to take it. And for the most part, I had incoming freshmen or folks who were in their um, first to fourth semester of school. So very early in their academic careers, very early in their college journeys. Um, fast forward to sort of the end of my time at Southeastern, I was almost predominantly teaching in our 100% online asynchronous master's program where I was the graduate coordinator. And so that type of learner demographic was very different. We had a lot of folks returning back to school that hadn't been in school in, in decades. They had been out in the workforce and they were coming to our program to either reskill or upskill so that they could either make a career change or um, look at advancement possibilities within their own job. But the needs of those um, learners were very different, but the through line was this idea that learning never stops. And so I wanted to keep that thinking about, okay, AI driven technologies are transforming the way people learn, how people learned 10 years ago, five years ago is not the way that they're learning now. Um, and so how does that how does that inform the way we think about open education and the way that it supports lifelong learning possibilities by providing accessible and flexible resources, enabling learners to adapt to evolving demands? So where was that synergy? 
So I've got all of these things kind of swirling around. They haven't really cemented into anything solid yet. So I was like, okay, what happens when you have a bunch of ideas? That it kind of looks like a, it, in my mind, I visualize a word cloud. I have all these ideas and concepts and guardrails, but how do I start to structure that into a framework that will allow me to move forward into from theory to practice? And so, um, as we journey forward in our in our conversation, um, I I wanted to introduce you to sort of the process that I took in 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 going along this path. And so the following "How might we?" questions served as a guide in my own exploration of the strategic synergy between AI and OER. And you know, traditionally, when you're talking about emerging technologies. Um, the questions and the concerns are often a lot around risk mitigation. If you think back to when ChatGPT first hit the, the, the culture, everything came, all the conversations, well, a lot of the conversations were centered around how do we control for this? How do we detect it? How do we, you know, regulate it? How do we have policies around it? And, and there's, a, there's obviously 100% a, a place for that. But I like to start from a place of um, opportunity before you hit the challenges. And so the how, the how might we framework really questions, they really adopt a more innovative stance, right? It's rooted in design thinking. And these questions really highlight the collective ability that if we start from a place of possibility instead of a place of peril, that there really is the opportunity to shape technology in service of human well-being and emphasize our shared agency, which is like super important to me. So the first how might we question um, that I had was how might we leverage AI to personalize learning experiences and address individual student needs with open educational platforms? And again, these questions are sort of like me taking all the stuff that you just heard me talk about and formulate that into questions that I could go search for solutions to see if they've already been created, or if they haven't been created, then that's the opportunity to create something. And so in my search, I came across a paper written by two researchers, which I linked to that in the Discord channel in my resources document. Um, so you can read the full article. Um, but uh, two researchers from the University of Sao Paulo, um, they wrote about a chatbot that they designed called OER Chat. Um, which was to provide open educational resources for introductory programming students based on specific user queries. And so according to the paper, OER Chat aimed to recommend relevant OER materials, slide courses, textbooks, et cetera, to users based on what they asked for. And so this capability of matching user needs and questions to suitable learning resources, could be potentially uh, extended to personalized learning paths and recommending appropriate materials tailored to the individual student's knowledge, levels, interests within the open educational platform. Um, the chatbot uses a conversational interface, um, which made the learning experience more interactive and engaging for the students, as reported in the paper, um, compared to traditional interfaces for accessing open educational content. So instead of just sending them to a repository or even um, having like a lib guide um, in in the on the library's webpage, this just made the experience more interactive uh, for the students. Um, the researchers mentioned that OER Chat um, has an open architecture that allows the users to extend and improve its models, data, sources, and processing mechanisms, which is one hundred percent in line with open edu uh, open education pedagogy. And so, this openness enables further development and integration of personalization techniques driven by student data, learning analytics within the open platform. So it's like, okay, so there's a chat bot that kind of does what I'm seeing some synergy around. But if you read the article, there are some challenges. And I even included a blog post in the resources section of the Discord um, where the, the blog author kind of talks about the sort of limitations of the tool that was built. So it was a step in the direction to practical application, but not completely there. So moving on to the next, how might we question, how might we utilize AI to create accessible learning environments that accommodate diverse learning styles and abilities in open education? And so I've talked about this in other presentations. X5 Gone was a European Union funded project that used artificial intelligence to index and curate open educational resources on the web, like 
the World Wide Web. Um, it employed techniques like web scraping, transcription, machine translation, all sorts of things to identify, extract, and represent OER content. And so according to the project developers, um, the project aimed to build AI models that could compare documents, match keywords, analyze characteristics like difficulty level to provide an intelligent search function and recommendation tools for OERs. And then ultimately, X5Gon um, explored using AI to enhance discoverability, accessibility, and potential rem remixing of the open educational um, materials. And so it had really, really lofty goals. I mean, we're talking about um, automatic translation um, into multiple languages, transcribing audio and video into text, and then vice versa, so that multimedia and multimodal content could be automatically generated. Um, um, allowing for the potential to recommend alternative formats or, su or supplementary resources suitable for different learning styles. Um, analyzing, this was really cool. The project wanted to build the capability to analyze factors like sentence word length to estimate the difficulty level of the course if that wasn't already sort of stated in the resource to help match resources with appropriate ability. And then finally, use AI to build and generate fully full courses using um, just sort of a combination of OER content that then could be customized and adapted to individual learners' needs. It was a big lofty goal. And to my knowledge, I don't even I don't think the the um the project is active anymore. A lot of the links, um, even since the last time I talked about X5 gone, um, the links don't work anymore. And that's really like disheartening because there was a lot of promise, there was funding, there was a lot of opportunity around what um, X5 Gone wanted to do in terms of OER and AI at scale. Um, so I was like, okay, this was great, but it didn't make it to completion. Um, we've got proof of concepts, but we don't have a deliverable yet or a sustainable deliverable. So, okay, I'm going to keep asking questions. And so then my final question was, how might we engage learners as co-creators of AI-driven educational content and resources, fostering a sense of ownership and agency in their learning journey with open education. And so two years ago, um, I started on a project to advocate for zero textbook cost um, our, our, for our department to be to have zero textbook cost programs, um, in part because I had seen the struggling incoming students who barely made it into college and then we're having exorbitant textbook, fee, textbook fees, which were preventing them from um, continuing on in their education. Flip to the end of my time at Southeastern, where I were seeing these adult learners return to the graduate classroom and oftentimes paying for their own education. And it was a lot, it was a financial commitment just to get through the tuition. And so to not have a textbook cost was really helpful for people who had mortgages and car notes and just real world responsibility. So I became very, very adamant about carving out space and time and trying to find resources to develop um, an open educational ecosystem um, for our department and really for the discipline of communication and media studies, more specifically strategic communication. So what developed was the core project, Communication Open Resources for Education, um, which my goal was to develop open educational resources for communication and media studies using digital humanities methods, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. And my primary goals were one, to expand access to digital humanities ex, uh, education, um, because we sit at a really interesting intersection of sort of soft skills and hard skills. And I think in the conversation around where skills, um, where skills, uh, where the place of skills are in higher education, I thought that, you know, our discipline could articulate some of that very interestingly. And then to promote um, engagement by reducing textbook costs. I mean, I found out just in my research and talking to students as I was trying to be, you know, very user centered and focused that a lot of students would just not buy the textbook and they would just go online and try to find whatever they need to be able to complete the coursework, but they just literally couldn't afford to buy the book or the resources. Um, uh, the project involved developing, you know, broadly developing OER course templates 
for most of our courses in the undergraduate and graduate program. That could then be remixed by incoming professors, but that incorporated the OER textbook. I'm calling it a textbook, but it's feeling like it's turning into more of an encyclopedia um, that um, covered the sort of main components of, um, of the discipline. So content creation, content strategy, um, ethics, um, analytics and measurement. So those those like four kind of pillars of the discipline, but then breaking it up, each class would have a section and then that professor could pull that out for their, their course, but it, it is all in one place. My idea was sort of a merger of um, the chat, OER chat, which was specifically for, for programming students and X5 gone. So how can you both be universal, but also be very specific? And also how can you reduce the number of places that both the faculty person and the student have to search for resources. How can I build this sort of like all-inclusive um, platform? And so thinking about the way that innovation imperative operates in that synergy between AI and OER, I now had another set of guardrails that I wanted to think about. So things that were really important as I started building the core platform, collaboration and knowledge sharing. So it was really important to, for me that the platform was a place where educators, researchers, students could contribute their expertise and their insights and their feedback on the course templates in the textbook. And all of that was documented in a way that was open so that people could kind of see the architecture. A lot of times you get things on the back end and you see the finished product, but I don't know about you. I like to know how things are built because I may not build it exactly like you, but knowing your, your framework and how you design a thing can help me um, as I'm designing my thing. So that was really, really important. Continuous improvement. So incorporating user suggestions and contributions so that there really was this aspect of co-creation and refinement of content over time. Um, what we found in our field is that information becomes outdated very quickly because we do sit at this intersection of communication, technology, media, and culture, and those things evolve very rapidly. And so you could have content that you created, you know, at the beginning of the year that by the time the next school year started, you needed all new information. And textbook publishing to this point was not really meeting that need. Um, industry was creating content, but it didn't oftentimes have that educational support that we needed in the classroom. So being able to have conversations around what has changed in the field in the last year and incorporating those conversations and feedback suggestions into the platform in an open way was really important. Along those lines, community engagement, so encouraging active participation and knowledge sharing through forums, um, uh, similar to the Discord uh, um, interface that is happening for this conference, discussion boards and virtual events, but all within the platform, right? So if you're interested in communication, more specifically digital humanities, you could engage in this platform no matter where you are and have access to talks like this and enlightening talks and, and be able to talk and be able to discuss with others who are in that same community, discipline community, um, in a very open way, but in a, in a safe and protected way. And then finally, co-creating with AI. Um, that is sometimes a controversial thing to say, but I think as AI technologies, particularly, particularly generative AI technologies become more ubiquitous. I mean, I just sat through this week, OpenAI talked about all of their new features. Um, Google's Gemini talked about their new features. And I don't know about you, but if you use Microsoft or Google, the AI companions, you can't get away from them. They're there to help you rewrite an email or to gather your thoughts or to summarize your meeting notes. So really um, being intentional about thinking about co-creating with AI that in a way that keeps a human in a loop was really important for me in terms of having learners um, foster a sense of ownership and agency in their learning journey. So... Um, so there's a lot of opportunities in, in what I discussed, you know, personalized learning experience, increased accessibility, enhancement of educational content, global collater collaboration, sustainability, preparation for future challenges. Those are all like really, really great opportunities, but I would be miss if I did not um, touch on that there are some real challenges around this. And if you look at the resources um, that I have in the document in the Discord channel, um, I do think some of the authors do a really good job 
of being very uh, vocal about what the challenges um, around innovation in general are, but more to particularly when you start incorporating AI. So top of mind is ethical and privacy concerns. That has been an issue since the internet and technology and education have merged. How do we keep information private that needs to be private, but also be able to move and innovate with the way that the world is changing. And I do think that open education practitioners sit at this really interesting intersection of that because we've always had to operate in this space of being open, but also um, being aware of privacy concerns, particularly as they are, if you jump to the bottom, regulatory, right? So like, how can you be open in the age of FERPA? Or if you're not, uh, you know, um, in the EU, those sort of changes around privacy and data. So I do think, again, that open education practitioners are uniquely positioned to be meaningful in these conversations. And I, I hope we show up more in them, but also challenges around bias and fairness. Algorithms are not neutral. They are built by humans and humans have biases. And oftentimes those biases, whether intentional or not, are inherent in the in the algorithms, in the outputs of those algorithms. So how can we be mindful of that? I think you control for that by inviting more people to the space to participate because the more voices help to mitigate that some. Accessibility in the digital divide. I mean, I, I told you I live in the South, I live in Louisiana, and there are several spaces where there is no internet. I have students, um, you know, during the pandemic that became very apparent when everyone had to switch to remote. And there were people who were like, I don't have access to the internet. I come to school to use the internet or I go to the library. Um, when there are weather events, um, it is it is very detrimental to the progress of learning, particularly here, because it's very hard to say, oh, I'm just going to put your resources online in the learning management system or whatever, and you can go do it, because there are literally people who don't have access to, to the internet, and they're not able to access those resources. So what happens when we're layering on now another level of technology in terms of AI, in terms of uh, accessibility and the digital divide? Quality control and relevance. Um, the promise of, of AI, and more specifically generative AI, is that you can automate um, and generate information at a much quicker pace. The concern is the quality of that information um, and, and what measures do we have in place to ensure that what is being put out there is what we need and that it is relevant to the goal and the purpose of whatever you're creating the content for, especially if that information is being generated literally at the speed of light. Dependency on technology, and this is, a, is a, again, a fascinating in, intersection, and I won't get and won't bore you with sort of like the technology design and how it is intended to keep you on it and that the, 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 you know, the sort of scroll mentality, like there's reasons why you can go down rabbit holes and wormholes. It, it, it is designed to do that. And, and more importantly, that what I've seen over the past few years is the shift to educational interfaces looking more like these um, marketplace design interfaces, which also are kind of meant to keep you engaged in the platform, not necessarily because the content is so um, engaging, but the algorithm. And so what does that mean for the future of learning? And um, Mark Watkins, who I follow on X, uh, wrote a blog post about frictionless education and sort of the danger of frictionless education and how, especially with artificial intelligence and, and generative AI and this ability to kind of like just very quickly and uncritically consume a lot of information that educators more than ever have to be human disruptors. Um, and so anyway, dependency on technology is a challenge. You don't want your educational experiences to sort of exacerbate or compound a problem that we've been discussing in other areas and other sectors for a long time. Techno technical and financial ba uh, barriers, teacher and student adaptation, and then finally regulatory and policy issues. You know, I believe this week the federal government just released some guide work and frameworks around AI. This is going to be an ever-changing space, right? There, there's, there's going to be probably definitely more conversation, possibly more regulation, 
definitely policy. I'm sure you at your institutions have had those conversations. So those are real challenges when you're trying to innovate and kind of move forward, but also being mindful of the constraints that may come in these other ways. Okay, so taking all of that, right? Taking all of that, me, we'll, we'll go back to my journey, taking all of that in. So thinking about the foundational concepts, forming some how might we questions and thinking about possible opportunities for solutions, being mindful um, to balance the opportunity with the challenges. How do we get to, to practical application? So um, circling back to this big goal I had of developing zero textbook cost program, based on the needs of the learner. For me, the first step was to create and curate an OER data set. So I spent a significant amount of time um, uh, going through various OER repositories and pulling OER content that I felt was relevant for, um, for our discipline. And because the discipline is sort of an amalgamation of several other disciplines, marketing, management, business, tech, computer science, data analytics, traditional communication, digital communication, it took some time. And so I did leverage some like metadata scraping and um, some artificial intelligence that is not necessarily general, generative AI to be able to query these databases in a more efficient way than just going through the normal search to be able to pull that information. So created this big massive OER data set. And then the next step for me was I wanted to develop an AI assisted course building tool powered by, o by OER. So I wanted to do my own version of OER chat because I felt like I already kind of had the big platform idea with core. What was missing was a more specific chatbot and I am a very, very basic programmer, self-taught. And I was like, okay, this is a project where, you know, I, I, I tell my students, it's it's good to learn, but you also need to do. This was my doing. And so what you saw on the screen um, is, is sort of um, the prototype for what I called Strat Sync Bot. Um, and my real goal was to help encourage my colleagues in my department to adopt OER content. Because when I would go to them and be like, hey, let's not Let's maybe have some discussion before we, you know, adopt this textbook again. Like, let's, can we talk about it? it? There were very valid concerns around the sort of lift of revising a, a course using OER content. If the OER content didn't have the ancillaries that a traditional textbook would have, um, how, where would that information come from? Would that have to be built by the faculty member and then things like integration into the learning management system and how is that gonna work? And so I was like, okay, I can't tackle all of those very valid um, hesitations around OER adoption, but maybe if I could create something where they could ask it questions from the content angle, we could figure out the course design angle later. So using AI, the bot automates the generation of course materials. And that I found in, they look, they were not perfect. Again, basic programmer, not perfect, but it was a starting place. And I found with my faculty, it was easier to sit down um, with them and sort of walk them through the tool and give them something to edit, revise, um, rework versus starting with a blank screen. Um, and what I found is that it significantly reduced um, the labor and time required for course development and they were more willing to try it again. So um, my approach in developing uh, Stratsync Bot was really that synergy of what I know about AI and what I know about open education and really human-centered design principles. Um, and I was really invested in finding the pain points of the needs of our and the needs of our faculty and really trying to deliver on something that provided those solutions that not only enhanced teaching practices, but also helped with workflow efficiency. Um, and then beyond that, the, the idea and really one of the reasons why I'm making a shift in my career is that I really want to invest my time and energy and whatever, you know, information I have and intellect I have to share um, around building these sustainable AI influenced, informed, enhanced, I'm not quite sure on the language I want to use yet, um, ecosystems um, that are open. And so another project that I'm working on is creating success coaches powered by OER trained generative AI that would live on the core platform. And these coaches would be able to provide personalized feedback, 
um, leverage AI language processing capabilities to assist students with limited English proficiency and utilize AI-based OER tools to support students with disabilities by providing adaptive assessments, alternative formats, and different accessibility features. And, you know, ultimately, a lot of those ideas are borrowed from the X5 Gone project um, in that the core platform would deploy open technologies for recommendations, learning analytics, learning personalization, all the things. Um, and then really, it would also develop, this was also a really important piece for me, it would also develop services for media convergence, right? And so to kind of address that idea that if I maybe don't go with the textbook publisher that has everything sort of packaged in a SCORM package or in a in a um, digital downloads or ancillaries or instructor resources, that not only would you have access to sort of some pre-created content, that the platform is adaptive enough that once you actually know who the learners are in your course, you're able to remix and adapt that con uh, content for the learners in real time. Um, and that, you know, is always sort of a challenge. You do your best with universal design, but you, you can't account for everything. And so how can we leverage this, you know, technology to be able to better deliver um, educational resources to our students in real time and not having to 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 wait. And that that was really, really important. So I want to make sure I have enough time. Yes, I do have enough time for um, questions and, and answers and discussion. So you have heard um, in the last little bit a lot about my path, my path that is changing even in the last 24 hours. Um, you've heard about opportunities and challenges and realities and dreams. I wanna leave you, and then you've seen sort of where I'm going, where I'm thinking about going at the practical level, but I wanna leave you with some practical tips and takeaways. Um, the first tip I have just in general when you're thinking about strategic synergy of AI and OER is to start small and experiment. Um, a lot of learning management systems, courseware, um, there are just a lot of tool, a lot of AI tools that are being embedded as features in platforms, tools, software that you may already have access to. Um, for example, I use Canva for this presentation and Canva has magic, right? They have a tool in it where you can generate images. And so in just very small, low stakes way, you know, just sort of um, experiment, try things out. I think it is overwhelming because again, the information changes almost daily around a lot of these tools, but start where you can um, and then build from there. And then the next thing I say, would say, the next tip I would have for you is to collaborate and share experiences. What you just heard has been shaped by being in communities of practice with edu other educators, instructional designers, folks in my own industry who are thinking about OER and open education, but also thinking about AI. Um, these are folks within my discipline and not in my discipline at different um different parts of the institution. So centers for teaching and learning, centers for instructional design, librarians, though I love talking with librarians. I think librarians are awesome. And I've learned so much from them just about databases and repositories that have informed the work that I wanna do. And so I would encourage you, even if you feel like I have nothing to offer, because I often feel that way when I participate in some of these groups, I always take away um, something that is helpful for me in sort of the ideas that I have and really letting those ideas take shape. And so being able to learn from others' experiences while also sharing your insights helps us all sort of collectively move this work forward. So as you move through the conference, I have some just some points to keep top of mind as you listen to the remainder of the presentations today in the synchronous part and go back and look at the asynchronous stuff or maybe revisit the asynchronous content. So for talks on specific OER projects and initiatives, you know, as the presentation is going, maybe think about how using AI could help improve your own projects or even what you're hearing if AI is not a focus. Um, consider ways AI tools could increase collaboration and engagement in your OER work, and then think about strategies for AI and open education and how they could work well together. 
Um, and then for sessions on pedagogy and course design, you could think about how using AI ethically could apply to teaching with OER whenever I'm in a presentation, particularly around pedagogy and course design, I'm always thinking, how could AI be used in an ethical way to enhance this already awesome presentation and just take it to the next level? Or in my own work, if I'm doing similar, how could AI um, possibly move us closer to the goals that we have in terms of, of open education? Um, consider how AI tools, uh, consider AI tools that could integrate with open teaching methods to personalize learning, and then think about ways to use AI to create knowledge with students. And again, these are not like, you know, this is not um, dissertation level type of uh, brainstorming, but just things to think about as you are listening to other innovative ideas and projects. That has been so helpful in sort of cementing, not cementing, but guiding me in the path that I find myself on. So as an open education practitioner, I, I truly believe it is my responsibility to explore the potential of AI in, in OER. In one of, in the email I sent my students last week in sort of like my final email um, to all the students of the department, um, I just encouraged them to be brave. And I shared with them, I said, you know what? the thing that you are gonna do in life, the profession you have, the career you may have, the work you may do, it might not have even been created yet. The world could be waiting for you and your specific skill set and the way that you think about the things that you do, it could be waiting for you to be created. So don't be limited by what you can see. And I think that is, if I could leave you with something a bit more inspirational, it would be that I think there's a lot of noise and a lot of chatter. And I think as educators, we need to be cognizant and aware, um, you know, particularly around some of those challenges that we talked about, but also don't be limited by, by what you could see. If you would have um, at, looked, asked 18 year old me, if I would be on the path that I am about to embark on, I would have been like, absolutely not. I thought that I was going to have a much more traditional academic trajectory and that just that just wasn't the case. Um, but I love that the sort of synergy of this work of what we're seeing in technology and more specifically in AI, what we're seeing around innovation and education in terms of OER is coming together in a way that ignites a passion in me that is I can't deny it to the point that I I cannot not fully focus on it. So I truly believe that AI should enhance, not replace the human relationship between learners and educators, and that, that AI interactions should promote a pedagogy of openness. And I just really want to be committed to be present and advocate um, as a voice in the room in those conversations. So I want to leave you with a quote. It's the last quote that I gave to my students, the, the sign off in my email, and it's from Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I feel like it encapsula encapsulates our time today. And it's do not go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. So thank you for joining me this morning and for the others who will watch this later. I'm excited to hear your thoughts, questions, um, possible solutions, ideas, pushbacks, anything that you may have, um, please feel free to reach out. My contact information is on the slide. And I believe we have some time for some questions. So thank you all again. Um, this has been uh, a wonderful experience to be able to share. So I am going to... I'm going to stop sharing my screen because the slides are in, um, in the Discord channel. And Let's have some conversation. Mandy, I'm not sure the best way to facilitate the conversation. I apologize. I was not looking at the chat or the Discord channel because I was like, that's too many screens and I will 100% be overwhelmed and lose my place in what it's I'm saying. all good. Um, well, we haven't had any, well, except just now. We just had our first question. So I can read this. Okay. Um, There was some folks um saying, you know, saying they would love to connect and learn more about what you're creating, which sounds yeah. very exciting. Like I was very excited hearing about it. So, and um, I may be reaching out to you because like I said, I've, I've had some really great conversations just talking with, with librarians and folks who work specifically with OER repositories, because that was really the focus of X5 Gone. And I, I think sort of the pitfall of that, why it didn't 
deliver on the promise was that there wasn't, it didn't seem like there was someone who was specifically connecting all the pieces that needed to be connected for it to work at scale. And so in some ways I, I kind of see myself as maybe being that person. And so mm -hmm. I'm excited about having the time now to be able to do that. So, yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that's amazing that you've taken, like you're dedicating your time to it. I think that will result in something amazing. Um, okay, so we have a question. Could you speak a bit to how open access practitioners can simultaneously ensure openness and quality of content? I love the many op open access materials available, but I wonder if you might share a bit about how we as practitioners can ensure these materials are also peer reviewed and of high quality. Oh, yeah, that is... Yeah, that was the main pushback from my colleagues when I started bringing this because they would bring me pieces of content that maybe weren't up to their their standards and they're like, see, we can't do this. I, I think part of what needs to happen is sort of a massive peer review and that's hard to do because of late time, labor, like the resources needed to do that. I do think there is opportunity using artificial intelligence to sort of automate some of that process in the same way we have Grammarly and spell check and the, you know, like to, to make sure that the, the, the language is right. I think if we could, it, it's really sort of like a reorganization and database this is what I learned when I was doing the metadata stuff is cleaning up want a lot of the metadata and the tags and stuff so that it actually does what you want to do. So then you can get things all in one place and then maybe advocating for some resources for peer review, but like sustainable peer review. And then once you do it with humans at the same time, think about what, what of this process could be automated. If it's grammar, you know, like if it's like a grammar thing and sentence structure thing, maybe it's that. If it's formatting, right? There are there are AI tools that will help with formatting. Um, if it's with attribution and citation, or even like checking for links that don't work, like there, there are tools in industry that already kind of do that. So how can we advocate for those tools in this space? Um, so there's, I don't think there's an, I don't know that there's an immediate question, except for one of the reasons I I wanted to work in my discipline was for that. I, I was going to be the peer reviewer, right? And like, and go through and um, kind of see what was out there because I know for a fact, a lot of it is outdated just because of the last couple of years. Like, like stuff isn't relevant anymore at all. Um, but I think big picture, I think we have this artificial intelligence thing that is happening to us. How can we leverage it to do that? to ensure quality. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of conversations in the industrial design space about how generative AI will change the work of industrial designers and what part of that process will be automated. And I think that's a space where there's interesting conversations that can be carried over because there's a lot of review in that industri in, uh, 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 instructional design work. So what, how is AI sort of uh, impacting that and, and what can we learn from that and bring over into the to the OER space so thank you so much oh you're welcome thank you for your for your question yeah yes, I, I you. see I feel like um expertise of of faculty is even more needed than than ever so it's kind of like like you were saying throughout like co-creation not replacement <laughs> And I think that that peer review piece is part of that expert um, knowledge coming into play. And I think um, it can be done. Like, that's the mm -hmm. thing. I just think it it takes, I know as a faculty member and I've had admin roles, there's just not enough hours in the day to do the things that you have to do. And it leaves very little left over for the things that you want to do. And so I really had that moment of what would it look like if I flip that around? And the thing that I wanted to do was the thing that I had to do, right? And and mm -hmm. what what could I dream and then work towards making that a reality if I provided myself the space to do that? Because not everybody can, mm -hmm. but like, what if I could? So anyway, and here we yeah. are. <laughs> and here we are. And it's wonderful. Um, another question, amazing presentation. Would love to learn more about how you use AI on a regular basis. 
Sure. Um, so I have a, um, a whole like, like Google account that is in a Microsoft account that is everything I do is enhanced by AI. So I use, um, Gemini in, it's not in like my everyday, everyday, but, um, for the things that I do in that, those browsers, everything I use, and it's more for tracking. Um, so I have that, but that's like more of a research thing so that I could really track what is the use when you open up a web browser and you have like, if this is what ubiquity looks like for everyone, because right now it's for paid people. But like, if we think that this is going to be a thing that when everybody opens their browser, everyone has access to these things, what does it look like? So I have that, that I'm kind of tracking, but just like in my day to day, um, I have, I mean, I use things like a lot of people use, like I use Grammarly. I, I, um, it's hard because everything becomes research for me, but I do use, um, like I've used chat GBT and Claude and like all of those for various things. Um, a lot of brainstorming, I use it a lot of, of, for a lot of brainstorming, um, particularly because I'm also a person that it's very hard for me to start from a blank page. And so to be able to, in a very unsophisticated way, say, I'm thinking about um, an assignment that is based on X, um, that, you know, these are the outcomes of the course. What are some ideas? Another way that I use generative AI specifically a lot is I homeschool my children. And two of my children have learning disabilities. And my youngest son, Finn, who you saw on the slide, has, has autism. And so as someone who is a researcher and he sees specialists, I am not trained necessarily for that. So a lot of the work that I do is taking his assignments and asking what are some ways that this information can be communicated to my child that has these, specific, you know, the child that has these specific things and it generates ideas and not all of them work, but that's helpful for me. Um, to be able to have have a starting place. And it also help, is helpful for me when I talk with his um, therapists and counselors um, because we're kind of speaking a language that I would not have access to in, in other ways without a whole lot more research than I really have time to. So, and then I've carried that over into my classroom. So if I um, have accommodation papers for something that I don't quite know what the best way to deliver the information for, if it's like very vague, um, I will ask, like, this is the assignment. What are some suggestions for a student with this these specific needs? And again, it's not always a perfect science, and that's why a human needs to be in the loop because it's not going to know the structure of my class. I'm like, I'm I'm very careful about what I enter into these open models because many of them have not been transparent about the training data, um, which is why I built my own OER data set because I wanted to to be able to tell anyone who's using it, this is exactly what I'm using. And the fact that that is open content and it's openly licensed, it's okay for me to do that. So I wasn't using copyrighted material. You know, that's really important to me. But in terms of using these more open models, I keep everything vague. I almost make mirrors of the real thing. So um, it, it's not, you know, obviously not names and everything. If I want to use a data set that's in my class, I'll make, a different data set with different information to get suggestions on. And that's enough to generate ideas. Um, and so I, I usually use it really mostly for idea generation. I mean, and then the things that are just like, I have Grammarly. So, <laughs> um, and it's gotten very aggressive lately and wanting to change my syntax and sentence structure. But, um, you know, and I use spell check. I, I use image generation, but more for, um, logos or like if I have a framework and I want to add some icons to that and I can't really think about what the icon will look like, um, then I will, you know, go to a generative image um, maker or a logo maker and say, you know, can you provide me with some ideas around uh, a an icon for innovation or accountability or kind of like what you saw. So I'll, I'll use it for things like that, that are fairly low stakes, just because I am very cautious about what am I, what I'm inputting into an open system that I don't know how it will be used in the future. Um, but I do know things like Microsoft Copilot has Microsoft Copilot for education. I hear it's very expensive, but one of sort of the benefits, and I think ChatGPT for education and enterprise is that 
the data is private, your data is not entered, it, so they say, entered into the, the training data. And so it does sort of address a little bit of that. That's a long answer to your question, but hopefully I answered it. It's the calm major in me, like shortening things is the <laughs> thing I got to work on. But I think that's like, I love how wide ranging your answer is because I think that's the best way to learn it is to just try it a lot and just use it a lot. And I think that helps us because our students are doing that. So it helps us to see what they're doing, what they might want to do. Yeah. So um, I think we have time for one more question from our other keynote speaker. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. So much to think about. Toward the end, you hit on the challenges we can face in convincing colleagues to adopt OER. Do you have any additional advice for how to hand handle this? I mean, always going in with possible solutions and ways like I, I've, I've always found that like being like, you should do this and then walking away is never like a good idea, but one showing examples. And also, I mean, I have colleagues who are very data driven, so I pre and post test everything, <laughs> you know, I also do like, like exit interviews, like what'd you like, what, you know, built in reflections and sort of summarizing that information as justification has helped because it's very hard to argue with something that advances student learn, like with like learning. It's like, okay, we're here to do this and it's kind of doing this. So, you know, I try to like cut the argument off um, where it starts, but, but, but also, and that's everyone can't do this, but I was one like, Hey, if you want me to look at your syllabus, or you want me to look at your class, like I'm happy to kind of like have a conversation with you about this because I know you're just starting or maybe don't even know anything and I'm over here and I, I know the database is a little bit more or let me pull you, let me send you some links. I'm the, I'm the queen of like, let me send you some links um, that might be helpful based on, you know, the content that you teach and that at least keeps the conversation going and doesn't start like stop it with a hard no. Um, and I've had, had a lot of success for that. And then really at the end, I had a department chair that kind of made the decision. And that right there was, I can do a lot sort of like with grassroots advocacy, but the full support of administration and then at the department level, that was kind of like, no, this is where we're going because I've seen the return on for, for that person. I've seen the return on investment for this in terms of retaining our students and their just satisfaction of their educational experiences. Plus it drives the cost down. That was probably the ultimate motivator at the, definitely in the last two years of being able to, to get faculty on board because they kind of didn't have a choice. So, um, but leading up to that, some of the other ways were really helpful. Very good. So um, there are other questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. This has been so amazing. I'm very inspired. If you all are able to get into the discord, Elizabeth yeah. has like a very helpful um, uh, document with other links to resources that might be useful to you. But I want to say a huge thank you to Elizabeth for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, we are having a little bit of a break and we will regroup back here at noon for our next panel presentation. So thank you. Thank you all. And please, I'll try to hop in the Discord and answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs>